Last week we covered the first seven songs and I trust that you have enjoyed the session uh, that we delivered to you. And this week we're going to continue with the second seven songs and uh, this time I'll go straight into it uh, because there are a lot of things to cover and we do not want to waste too much time. So let me re read to you from the scripture first. The second seven song is from Isaiah 49 verses 1 to 13. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to me, that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, establish the land and apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and all my highways shall be raised up. Behold, this shall come from afar, and behold, though these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sain. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O heavens, into singing, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Last week, we said that the seven songs uh, depict the uh, service, the suffering and the exaltation of uh, the Messiah of the servant who is the Messiah. So today when we look at this scripture verse, we're going to look a bit more about his ministry. And I trust that we will learn something for ourselves as well. For we are patterned after the servant of the Lord. We too are called the servants of the Lord. So let's look just at the first verse. Verse 1. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named my name. Now I've underlined O coastland and you people from the far, because Israel was not the coastland. Israel, uh, and this was a prophetic word to the nations, the islands of the world, and the peoples from the end of the earth. So this reminds us the seventh song tells us of God's fulfillment of his covenant with Abraham. And if you if you do know Abrahamic covenant, you will know that God intends to bless the people of all nations. And so, listen to me, O coastland, and give attention, you peoples from afar. Let me just give you now uh, what I understand. We are Abraham's descendant by faith, and we are to be a blessing to the nations. Let's read the scripture from here. Genesis 12, verses 1 to, 2, 1 to 3, the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. 
and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Many people think that God's uh, first purpose and intention was Israel alone. But when you look at the Abrahamic covenant, you realize that the call of Abraham was to uh, take the blessings to the nations, to the families of the earth. If Abraham were to be obedient to the Lord, then God will use him and the descendants to be a blessing to the nations of this earth. That's why uh, Isaiah 49 uh, verse 1 starts with, Listen, you coastland, and to those who are far off. It's a message addressed to us who are Gentiles, who are, away, who are far away from, uh, not only geographically from Israel, but far away from the Lord spiritually. Let's look at this uh, the second part that I underline on this verse 1. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. Now, this is fulfilled in the birth of Jesus, the servant of the Lord. And uh, for us as well, when we are born again by the Spirit of the Lord, we too carry this name with the promise that we are the bearers of salvation to the world. Let's look at the scripture verse that talks about the fulfillment of the second part, called me from the womb and named my name. All right. Now, if you have been doing the uh, Life of Christ series, you'll remember Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 to 21, at the birth of Jesus, where uh, Joseph was wondering, should he proceed with uh, taking uh, Mary as his wife? And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So before Jesus was even born, he was called from the womb and he was named Jesus, meaning he will save his people from their sins. Verse 2, He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. Again, we want to look at how this was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, all right? You see, Jesus was hidden for the first 30 years of his life as he was being prepared for his ministry, just like that. In his quiver, he hid me. So for the first 30 years of his life, nothing was spoken about him except for when he was 12 years old. And so I'm going to show you the scripture from 12 years old, the preparation that was already beginning to take uh, root in his life. And uh, so again for us, we are preparing, we are being prepared by the Lord for our mission all these years of our life. And I want to suggest to us, it's time for us to be launched and hit our target. So let's look at the scripture. Matthew, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 2, there are three verses to pick up, 40, 46, and 52. The first verse says, And the child, this was when he was 12 years old, the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So you see that God was shaping him. He was, uh, he was not known, he was being shaped, and he grew strong in spirit and in wisdom, and God's grace was upon him. Now the second thing uh, that we, uh, in verse 46 we want to read is when he was in the temple and after Joseph and Mary found that uh, he was not with them on the way back to Nazareth, they went back to the temple uh, to look for him and they found him sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. In other words, Jesus was being shaped not only just in spirit with wisdom but he began to understand the word of God in fact those teachers who were listening to him were astonished at his understanding and answers and I want to suggest to us that in the years of our life that God is shaping us he's shaping us to be strong in the spirit to be filled with the wisdom of God and to know his word because without these things we are not able to actually uh, accomplish the purposes that God has for us. And the final verse, Jesus increased in stature, wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So when he was 12 years old, the Bible uh, gave, us, gave us a glimpse of what uh, God was doing with him. 
uh, and uh, shaping him, sharpening him, and so that later uh, he could be prepared to be released to his ministry. I want to take you to a very short uh, introduction, just four uh, uh, slides on how they make arrows. We are all arrows in God's hands, huh? and God hides us in His quiver until it's time for us to be released. So that is a training for ministry that's now going on in your life and my life, okay? The making of an arrow. We, you and I are arrows of the Lord intended to be shot and achieve the target that God has given to all of us. First, every arrow, now I'm talking about making arrow in the olden days, not in present days where you know you make them of steel. Okay, you, in the olden days, you would have to select a piece of uh, wood and you would sharpen it, you would straighten it. Straightening it so that it is it will be true when you shoot it, so it is straightened. I would like to liken straightening as training in character. So while we are growing as a child, uh, if you're a child of God, uh, as a Christian from early days, or even uh, when you become a believer, one of the things God wants to do to us to shape us is to shape is to strengthen. Uh, is to straighten us, to train us in character. Training in character is not an easy thing. For some of us have got characters that are bent and a little bit crooked, and God has to straighten it. So there'll be some pain, especially when God has to take away from you those things that you've been uh, that is wrong in your character. Now, after straightening that uh, that piece of wood that's going to be made into an arrow, the next thing people do is to sharpen it. So the tip needs to be sharp, sharpening of the arrow. And I want to liken it to training in the skills that are necessary for you to uh, to achieve your ministry, uh, your life purpose. So. Everything we've gone through in our life, and I want us to understand that uh, all these years that we may not even have been a Christian, but all these years, God has been training you in ministry skills. Never ever think that any of your experiences in the past has been wasted. It has not been wasted. Even today, my training in uh, uh, Pete Marwick Mitchell as an accountant and auditor has come in very useful. Understanding of systems has helped me in organizing the church and uh, in administration and all the skills are needed. So you are being sharpened uh, with skills and never underestimate what God has taken you through in your life. God can turn it and in fact he's preparing you for your life purpose when he sharpens you. And the next thing about uh, making the arrow is that after he's made it straight and sharpened it, then there's a lot of times taken to smoothen it. In other words, there will be that uh, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know whether they use sandpaper in those days or not, but they will be sanding and smoothing it. Why do you smooth that arrow? Because you do not want any anything that will affect its smooth path when it's launched. And I want to suggest to you that one of the areas of God shaping us is training us in social skills. That's why we see Jesus grew in favor with men and with God. See, social skills are important. You can have a very gifted, uh, an ability to do a lot of things. You could be very talented, you know, and you could have a very good character. You have integrity. But if you don't have good human social skills, many times it hinders us and we become, uh, we ourselves become a hindrance to what God wants us to do. And the fourth thing about making an arrow is it needs to be stabilized. And of course, we know in stabilizing the arrow, at the end would be the uh, affixing of the feathers at the back so that when it's when it shot forth, it does not wobble, all right? It's stable. And I believe that training God has, wants to put us through is grounding us in, secure, in security. Because many people are insecure, broken in life, 
And our insecurity makes us very unstable We cannot relate with people We take offence easily And uh, we sometimes uh, ourselves give a lot of offence to people Because when we are insecure and when we are hurt inside uh, we, They say hurting people hurt others as well And that's the fourth stage of shaping an arrow And the, finally, the launching God has to bring you to the place where you know what's your life purpose Then He draws you All this while, while He's doing that, he's, you're in His quiver Like Jesus was in His quiver for 30 years And then when the Lord released Him into ministry In three and a half years, He accomplished the purposes of God He prepared 12 men One of them fell, of course He prepared these 12 men to take on the leadership of the church and to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth and he was ready to go to the cross so we need to have a life purpose and so in the shaping and the making of an arrow that we read about right these are the things that God wants to do in your life let's come back to the servant song uh, verse 3 and he said to me you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified God intends that our life should glorify Him We are called to glorify Him And if we look at uh, what to be glorified uh, How to glorify God I suggest to you that God is glorified on earth When His servants complete the work that He has sent them to do Right? Uh, we finish our life Run the race, finish the course And we glorify God in our lives By finishing the task He has given to us And this I pick up from the scripture Because this is in the high priestly prayer of Jesus John 17 verse 1 to 4 This is when Jesus is about ready to go to the cross And to return to the Father And he prayed this prayer We call it the high priestly prayer Because he prayed for his 12 disciples And he prayed also for those who would believe Afterwards that for us And this is what Jesus said When he had spoken this word He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said Father the hour has come Glorify your son That the son may glorify you Now we're not going to cover this part yet But some of the things That you will understand is that When Jesus said glorify your son He was saying that when he goes to the cross He's going to suffer humiliation And pay the price for sin But God's going to glorify him By raising him up from the dead And that resurrection itself Will glorify God All right, That we are not going to cover today But this is so you understand Glorify your son That the son may glorify you Since you have given him authority over all flesh To give eternal life to all whom you have given him And this is eternal life That they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent Then he makes this statement I glorify you on earth Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do Then brothers and sisters We need to finish what God has given to us And when we finish what God has given us to do And it's not necessary only the things that people say is the work of God Your life calling may be different from the life calling of Will be different from the life calling of other people And it is not to be compared to the life calling of people who are called to be pastors To be missionaries You can be called into a field of work Where God specially gifted you for that And He has a purpose for you to accomplish in the world As you carry His name And bring salvation to those people around you Now continue this verse 4 But I said I have labored in vain I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity Yet surely if my right is with the Lord And my recompense with my God So my encouragement is that we must not be discouraged When we do not see the fruit of our labor in the vineyard of God Now there have been many missionaries who have gone out to, uh, to hard ground To difficult places And, uh, and they labor and, and they see very little fruits uh, for a long time And they get discouraged And they say I've labored in vain You know And some of us may also have said Lord I have sought I've sought to please you And do your work But it looks like I don't see the kind of fruit That I expected And But this is said of the servant of the Lord uh, That is the Messiah 
Uh, how come he said, I've labored in vain, I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity? But of course, he says later on, my right is the Lord and my reward is with my God. Does it mean that whatever he did was useless, in vain, but God will reward him somehow? That's not what exactly what he means. I want you to see the ministry of Jesus. Huh? Uh, it was as far as his first calling is to Israel as a nation. Uh, the scripture says, the true light, which is Jesus, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. In a sense, it is like we know the outcome of his ministry with the Jewish nation. In a sense, it was like he labored in vain. It was like fruitless. But we need to see beyond to the reward of the Lord and to the fruit of his ministry in a long-term basis. You see, Jesus was rejected by the Jewish nation. It would seem like his labor was in vain. Next verse. Look at Isaiah's calling himself. You know, when Isaiah was called in chapter 6, verse 8, and 8 to 10, uh, he had a calling that was doomed for failure. We, 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 we sometimes wonder, Lord, please don't call me into a calling where whatever I do, I don't see any fruits. But listen to what the Lord said to him. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to these people, See, Isaiah's ministry will also seem to be futile or labor in vain. He is also a servant of the Lord. And this is what the Lord said. He will speak to the people, keep on hearing, but they will not, do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of these people dull and, his, and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. I am... I think Isaiah must be wondering, Lord, why are you commissioning me to speak to the people and then they are not going to listen to me? Why, why are, what are you doing that? But he did not perhaps understand the purposes of God in putting down the 66th chapter of the book of Isaiah, which gives so much hope to us who are not in his days, but beyond. All right? So it would be like he labored in vain. All right? And so let's look at some more verses. Jesus, when he, towards the end before his crucifixion in the Passion Week, uh, in Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, and we have done the Passion Week, eh? uh, he speaks, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He was very conscious that in his first ministry to the Jewish nation, they will reject him. And he would leave that house desolate. There was going to be a destruction of the temple and the Jewish nation was going to be scattered and the period of the Gentiles would come for 2,000 over years until towards the end where Israel will come back again into the timetable of God. And look at this verse here. Where we continue, he says, But I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense with my God. And here is where we need to understand that at the end of this present age, the reward for Jesus' labor is certain. And so we, in the same way, will receive our reward for our faithful ministry when He comes. You know, for those uh, uh, missionaries that spend their life and see badly little fruits, and then they return home disappointed, they will not know the reward awaiting for them, but it's going to be a great reward. And many of them, when they come home, later years, other people went and reaped reap the harvest that they have sold for. And so we need to see long term. When you do what you are doing and you feel that you're not making 
any impact at all, trust God. Keep on doing it. You have not labored in vain. You have not sprang your strength for nothing and vanity. And sometimes you say, I've given my life to doing this, but Lord, I've given 10 years now. Nothing has happened. What, when are you going to do something uh, exciting in my ministry that I was looking forward to? Keep on being faithful. And I want to bring to you the reward for Jesus. Revelation 7, 9, verse 10. After this, I looked, John Apostle looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. It looks like a defeat. It looks like all his energy spent and all was coming to an end. But he looked beyond. And this is the result of his ministry. This is the result of what he did on the cross. A great multitude from every nation is going, are going to be standing before the throne, before the Lamb. And they're going to be shouting, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Well, that's the nation. But what about Israel? Well, Look at Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 27. All Israel will be saved. Lest you be wise in your own eyes, Paul was writing to the Roman church, the Gentiles like us. Huh? I don't want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Today, Israel is a very secular nation, all right? And uh, except for a few orthodox uh, 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 priests and the Orthodox movement. The Christian, the Christians in Israel uh, is also a minority. Majority of them are secular atheists, and they have not come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because this is still the times of the Gentiles. This is still the time when we, the church, is uh, growing from the nations. But the scripture says, all Israel will be saved one day. Until the full, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come, all Israel will be saved. It is written, The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. When I took the first trip, a tour group to Israel, I spoke a verse on Mount Olives to the people. I said, what you see in Jerusalem, the beauty of the place, uh, the modern uh, technology and everything that's there, there's going to come one day, because the scripture verse says, there's going to come one day before the end comes with Jerusalem, an army will gather around Jerusalem, and they will sack the city, and half will be uh, sent out, and the others uh, left behind, as it were. And there will be a great earthquake splitting Jerusalem into half before the Lord lands on the Mount of Olives. So that day will come. Now let's continue our seven songs, verse 5. And, uh, and now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel, Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Here, the Lord is outlining the ministry of Jesus. And the first ministry of Jesus was to restore Israel. Jacob, which we saw, looked like he failed. Huh? But at the end of the age, we know that he succeeded. So he was called to bring Jacob and Israel back, the backslidden Israel, to bring back to God. And we know that the scribes, the Pharisees, they rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And that was for a purpose. Because then I want you to look at the scripture verse that Jesus was first sent to the house of Israel. In accordance to this Isaiah 49, he was first sent to the house of Israel. And then, therefore, we must pray for Israel for her salvation. Look, Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, the house of Israel. Jesus sent out his 12 disciples, instructing them when they first sent them out, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritan, but go rather to the lost sheep 
of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand the reason when Jesus first came for the first three and a half years of his life he focused on Israel was because he was focusing on his mission the first part of his mission which was to bring back Jacob bring back Israel so that's why he did not go to the Gentiles not because he didn't like the Gentiles but because that was the first part of his ministry he had to fulfill it first he had to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and we know that the scripture says uh, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant in other words God was saying it's actually too small for you just to restore Israel to bring back the preserve of Israel I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of this earth that's the second part of his ministry and from the first part of ministering to the house of Jacob to the second part of ministering to the nations something has to happen and that was would be the rejection of Jesus by the nation of Israel so the gospel now is brought forth to the rest of the world right so let's look as we say here because God's intention is for his salvation to reach the end of the earth so we must learn therefore to participate in missions to unreached people's group all right this is to the ends of this earth because Jesus had a twofold ministry to Israel so therefore we pray for Israel because Jesus has a second ministry to the ends of the earth therefore we must participate in missions to the unreached people's group let's read from the scripture in the passion week you would have covered this all right the parable of the vineyard here now another parable there was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine uh, wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country when the season for fruits drew for fruit drew near he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit and his tenants took his servants and beat one killed another and stoned another again he sent other servants more than the first and they did the same to them finally he sent his son to them saying they will respect my son but when the tenants saw the son they said to themselves this is the heir come let us kill him and have his inheritance and they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him now when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do with those tenants when Jesus told this parable of the vineyard he was speaking to the scribes the Pharisees who was rejecting him in the temple and Jesus was telling them the story you and the nation of Israel is like this vineyard it is belongs to me I planted the vineyard I sent my prophets to speak to you to return to me but you stoned them you 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 ill treated them and I sent my son and he was referring to himself I sent uh, and uh, he sent his son and they killed his son Jesus was saying prophetically to the scribes and Pharisees you're gonna kill me even before the crucifixion of the cross you're gonna kill me and Jesus asked this question when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes what will he do to those tenants so the backs the question what is he going to do with the nation of Israel and we see the second part and the people replied the crowd was listening to him besides the scribes and Pharisees said to him he would put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season and he said to them have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and this was the Lord's doing and this marvelous in their eyes you know even the ordinary people replied to Jesus and said of course the owner of the vineyard will throw those wretches to out to a miserable death and he will take his vineyard and give to other people who are barefoot in their season and then Jesus quoted from scriptures and said this is what the scripture says the stone Jesus is that stone huh? the stone that the builders who are the builders the leaders of Israel the stone that the builders rejected they didn't want him has now become the cornerstone that's the foundation stone of the new building that God is doing and do you know what she, what, what was uh, said here this is the Lord's doing in other words prof Isaiah's prophecy was coming true they will listen and not understand yeah, they will see and not see why because God was moving this gospel good news of the kingdom 
beyond Israel to the ends of this world, to the other tenants who will give him fruits in this season. All right? So, one more verse and we will move on. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. So, the kingdom of God was taken away from Israel as a nation and given now to the church. And I want you to bear in mind what it says here are people producing its fruits. It's not just given to us that we just enjoy the fruit and don't uh, the have uh, the vineyard and don't do anything. We're called to be servants. We are to produce fruit in this vineyard that God has given to us. Right, let's move on. And he says, and Jesus came and said to them, uh, this is when the, uh, uh, this, this is not no longer just the parable of the vineyard, but this is the Great Commission, when Jesus actually fulfilled it and took the kingdom and gave it over to the church. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. See, no longer the Jewish nation, the disciples were told to go to the disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Verse 7, Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. God was speaking to the Messiah, to the servant, to who, who, him who is going to be the redeemer of Israel. And uh, abhorred by the nation, but received by the world. Kings, nations, princes of this world will prostrate themselves before, before you because God is faithful who has chosen you. Your labor will not be in vain. Verse 8. I'm going to go through these verses quickly now because uh, it would take too much time to cover and describe every verse from here until 13. Yeah? Verse 8 says, Thus says the Lord, in the time of favor, I've answered you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. I will keep, keep you and give you as a covenant to people to establish the land, to establish the portion, the desolate heritage. This is a reminder again to us of the mission of Jesus Christ, the vision that we have. God has given him to be a covenant, as we said in the first seven song. What he's supposed to do, he is going to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages to say to the prisoners come out the vision statement of Jesus to those who in darkness appear and what's going to happen is that God's going to feed the people he's going to those who come out of the darkness are going to be people like you and I who are going to be fed spiritually they shall feed along the ways in our journey to our destination on bare heights shall be their pasture they shall not hunger or thirst neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them for he who has pity on them will lead them and by springs of water will guide them uh, this prophetically also will happen in the last three and a half years of tribulation period for the Jewish people. All right? Prophetic words always have uh, immediate fulfillment, a secondary fulfillment, and a final fulfillment. But we see it today for us as the people of God that has come out of darkness. God's not going to leave us hungry or thirsty. He will lead us and by springs of water, He will guide us. He will make all my mountains a road and my highway shall be raised up. And behold, these shall come from afar. These from the north and from the west and these from the land of Cyrene. So, the nations are going to come from throughout the world. And in the last days uh, for Israel, all those who are dispersed are going to be brought back to Israel itself. And it ends by saying, Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have co compassion on his afflicted. I'm going to summarize the things that we have learned and we're going to finish uh, for this uh, morning service, right? I trust that you've, uh, you have 
captured the scriptures and the, and the fulfillment in Jesus and picked up some of the things that we are to do as a servant of the Lord. All right. Summary. Number one, we are Abraham's descendants by faith and we are to be a blessing to the nations. All right. That's what we need to know. We are to be a blessing to the nations. We are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to the near neighbors, wherever we go. Number two, when we are born again, like Jesus was born in the womb of Mary and given the name Jesus as the savior of the, of the people, when we are born again by the Spirit of the Lord, we also carry this name. That's why we are called Christians. Christian. Why are we called Christian? Because of Christ in us. So we carry the same name of Jesus with the same promise that we are to be the bearers of salvation to the world. Number three, the Lord has been preparing every one of us for our mission all these years. Time for us to be launched. Some of us have come through very difficult lives. And you wonder, in those days, was God with you? Was God shaping you? Why did he allow you to go through those brokenness and those pains of your life? And you look back and you look at it and you say, this seems to me like wasted years. But I want to suggest to you, God never wastes, like Rick Warren used to say, God never wastes any hurts that you've gone through. When he has healed you and comforted you with the same comfort he's given you, you can now comfort others. And I want to, I, I, I really realize that people who have been broken in life when they have been healed and restored are usually the people who are the most compassionate. They understand people who are broken. People who have gone through poverty, who have nothing in their pockets in those early days, are the people who understand those people today who have no money, right? And they are, and they are willing to give uh, everything within their pockets to help people because they've gone through the same situation. So you are being prepared for your mission and your mission will be unique to you. But what I want to say is, it is time for us to be launched. In Salt Shakers, time for us to launch you. Salt Shakers intend to shake the salt out, okay? In other words, another word for saying we intend to launch you as arrows to hit your target. And I believe God will do it. Now, Jesus, uh, I mean, it was said of the uh, servant of the Lord, I've labored in vain and kind of thing. So we must run the race, finish the course. Don't give up. Even when you feel that everything is collapsing around you, it's like it's meaningless what you're doing. Don't give up. Run the race, finish the course. Glorify God in our lives by finishing the task He has given us, right? Finish it. And we want to be a community that will encourage one another to finish it. And number five, we must not be discouraged when we do not see the fruit of our labor in the vineyard of God. Okay? There are people who have labored for years. In fact, I remember this missionary uh, uh, who went to a tribe in, uh, I forgot, South America. And they landed on their plane in the river, uh, in the place there. And... Uh, they barely could start their ministry and they were killed by the, the natives there. And people say, it's a waste of young people's life. Years later, their wives went back to the same mission field and the work of God was flourish and begin to flourish unto them until the people, the tribes there turned to the Lord. So don't be discouraged when you don't see the fruit of your labor in the vineyard of God. Everything God sees, God understands and God holds it precious. I know the things you have committed. Paul says that we know the things we have committed to him and that he's able to keep it. What you have committed in your life in ministry, God knows and he understands. We shall receive our reward for our faithful ministry when he comes. We must pray for Israel and for her salvation. Now, what I mean is this. Israel today is not a godly nation. But because of Jesus' heart for Israel, and one day Israel comes back, we must pray now for Israel's salvation. We don't agree with the many things they do versus the Palestinian, many of whom are Christians. We're not saying everything Israel do is correct today, but we're saying that Israel has a part to play in God's timetable. So we as Christians are called to pray for Israel for her salvation. And finally, we must participate in missions to the unreached peoples group. I want to add a few things here before we conclude. I believe we are 
coming to a time when uh, you and I are matured Christians and uh, God entrusts us with the finances is given to us that we may use it for the work of God. Our first commitment, of course, is to the house of God, the place where you are fed. So you give to us the house of God so that the house of God may have plenty to be able to do the work we want to do. But we need to participate in community development as well. That's why we challenge you to give to, uh, to the poor, to feed the poor as well. And I thank God, uh, we just sent out some photos of uh, the food that we have, the food bank that was given to uh, the poor around this Tanjung Bunga area. So we continue to do that. But I want to highlight missions. Many of us feel that we can't go anywhere, we're not involved, that's it. All right? And uh, you know, the church, because of the financial situation we had earlier, we made a decision to cut missions to support the missionaries that we were supporting before. But I believe God has a purpose because what's happening today is that God, uh, in, the, uh, in the church model I mentioned before, the, s the idea about missions is that ordinary Christians like us begin to invest in missions into people's, into missionaries' life. So the role of the church is to recommend to you people who are faithfully serving in missions. I want to make mention of these people that we have supported in the past that we may not have supported, may not be supporting now. We want to mention people like JP and Rita serving in Bulgaria, and we know them, we know their lives uh, glorify God, their heart and motives are correct. And we know people like Peter Chong and his wife Swatley serving God in Chiang Mai. And uh, uh, well, by the end of this year, our support as a church to them will end, all right? So, but they are people worth supporting. And they, of course, there are the two uh, missionaries in uh, evangelists in Papua under Pastor Effort Venus of Makassar. These are the t uh, these are the three. Uh, they're doing great work there. These are three places we're supporting. Now that we are not sending mis uh, mission funds to these people, I will still want to encourage you individually to begin to support these people. All right, from what God has given to you that you get behind JP or Peter, uh, Peter Chong or Effort and say, we believe in your ministry, we want to support you. And because it may be hard for you to send the money to them because you may want to support in small amounts. So my suggestion that we can continue missions and participate in the Unreached People's Group would be that uh, you can give it to the church and specify to the missionary you want to give it to. And we will coordinate so that when we have a certain amount of money that's big enough, we will send so that there's, uh, we lose less in bank commission and charges. So I'm serious about this, brothers and sisters. Not only must we pray for Israel for salvation, not only must we minister to the needs of the community, but we must participate <coughs> in missions to unreached people's group. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the message of this morning. May God bless you. <coughs> may God bless you. And may we all uh, continue to give glory to God in our role as the servants of the Lord. Okay, can finish. <coughs> I will cut off the...